Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Sales Optimist Fight. We're joined by Simon Owens, currently Sales Operations Manager at Redgate Software. Hello, Simon. Hi. Now, Simon has over 20 years' experience in sales and about 25% of that in sales operations. So we're going to get a perspective here of someone who has extensive experience on the sales side, but then has more recently moved into the operations side. Correct, yeah. So let's kick off with the first question on how you originally got into sales operations. I still don't know. <laughs> um, I definitely didn't apply for anything going back in the years. It was, it was a, fell into it basically. As, the, as I got into sales management and the roles I was doing, they became, I guess, more and more senior, um, more analytics, more strategy needed. Um, and it just grew from there. And I found that you're spending less time sort of managing a sales team and more time looking at the processes and mm -hmm. the infrastructure behind it and enabling the sales team to go and do their job. And then you end up getting into that sales ops role. So it's really hard to say when I first got into sales ops. But there must have been, like, there, there must have been something within you that, not, like, fell towards the operations side, right? Because yeah. could, could you have just stayed in management and then gone into sales leadership? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I guess the, the, the main one was at BT, phone books. When I was there, um, we were in a declining market, so business was a lot harder to get. We didn't have the resource of a, of a sales ops team behind us. So it was down to the managers to try and come up with ways mm -hmm. outside the box to go and try and generate more revenue. And that was analyzing data, analyzing trends, looking at more stuff like that. And that was a sort of the first major ops piece ahead of the management stuff that I started to do. And once I got into that, really enjoyed it, had some good success there. And then the next role I went to at Conica, again, there's more strategy, customer segmentation this time, and how we change our model. Um, and then I ended up at Sky, which was then really analytical. We did have some sales ops people working with us, but a lot of it was down to the managers and look at that local presence as well. Yeah. That's how that goes on. So each job sort of got more and more sales ops focused. And in the know. end, before I started with Redgate, I was probably doing well over 50% of my role was sales ops. Oh, that was at Sky. Yeah. Cool. And then you joined Redgate as pure sales ops. Pure sales ops, yeah. So this is your first pure sales ops role. Pure role, yeah. And how's it going? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there for two years. It's a great company. Um, um, and it's a company that I didn't mark to work for for a while and was lucky to get the position. Cool. And then in terms of total uh, resources and sales and then resources in your off, sales and off team, what are we talking? So we are the smallest team in Redgate, uh, three people, including myself, and we've got about 80, 85 salespeople, cool. managers in the business. So I've been asking everyone this, I'm trying to understand like the, the perfect ratio. Yeah. And it, it comes to about one to 20 Sales people are like one off person to 20 sales reps. And so you guys are a little bit over that, right? You have got one ops person to 20, 25, 30. 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. We need another, we will need another person mm -hmm. next year. With the growth plans we've got, with the way the business has changed, with the demands on us as a team and coverage, we will need additional headcount. Yeah. And what's the, the structure of the three? Well, what, what are the, the, the definition of? Roles between the three. So we've got three quite unique roles. Um, I've got Leslie, who's in Pasadena, US, um, and she looks after um, a lot of the basic Salesforce stuff for the American teams, and also the sales inbox, doing reseller quotes, that sort of thing. So, um, got Amanda in the UK, who is fantastic at Salesforce. Really, is a Salesforce guru within the sales team, Salesforce admin. Um, she does a bit of that sales inbox stuff, but primarily it's more about specific projects. It's about data enhancement, that sort of thing. And I sort of get involved in a bit of everything, um, but really focus on things like the strategy and the commission plans, mm -hmm. compensation, how those work, um, and just the governance of when those salespeople start trying to steal deals from each other. <laughs> I'm trying to be the judge and jury on that. Um, and then the new person you bring in, what do you think you'll give to them? So it's probably a bit of a cross between what Leslie does and Amanda does, um, and that'd probably be in the US because we're okay. a bit short on coverage over there. Cool. Um, so can we talk about quickly, you mentioned Salesforce, but the kind of tech stack for yeah. Redgate right now? It's probably not a lot different to most other businesses similar to us. Um, Salesforce is our CRM. We've been using that for a number of years, but it is a heavily customized version, which is something that sort of bit us a little bit now because we're finding that products don't necessarily integrate as smoothly as they should. Mm -hmm. So I think we're having to go back and sort of redesign that a little bit. Um, but we use Engageo in marketing, um, HubSpot as well. Um, we've got a product called Inside Squared, which we've been pushing really for the last few months mm -hmm. as a tool for the managers to really delve into their sales pipeline and hopefully get into the forecasting area. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and Power BI is that sort of salt, is our single source of truth for revenues. That's where the managers go to look at what how much we've done this month or, or period. What like what insights can Info Squared bring out from the data and sales force to help with forecasting? What's just one example? Um, for us, it's really about the visibility of the pipeline. We've got more into the accounts model, which is more predictable than a transactional sales model. You can't just think we're going to do ten or twenty or fifty thousand a day. Um, deals can be quite lumpy, they can come in at various times, mm. but it's understanding what the reps are doing on that. And while all it does is really replicate what you can do in Salesforce, it does it in a much more graphical, better way. You can tr uh, drill down into it a lot easier. So the managers can look at what deals are closing, for example, in the next 30 days <coughs> and keep drilling down into that. Um, and you know, the biggest thing we saw at the start of it was there was loads of deals forecasting to close this week that had been an open stage for... 200 days, we're still in open stage, there's been no engagement with the customer for two months, yet it's closing in two days' time, mm -hmm. and you know that that's not going to happen, but we're forecasting that. Got and it. now the sales manager being on top of that with the reps, you look at what's closing this week, for example, and you see that everything's in procurement, everything has got, or virtually everything has got um, action dates of the last couple of days, mm -hmm. and you can see that actually we can believe what we're doing here. And it gives the managers great, a great resource there to look into what the, the teams are doing, where we are, got the business. Um, you mentioned Amanda doing data quality yep. projects. How are you like holistically dealing with the data, the quality of the data in Salesforce? That's the big. That's the big thing because data is that living, breathing object that is never going to be perfect um, and is never going to do everything that you want. Um, it's trying to understand what data we've got and how we got to it. So a lot of the data we've got has come from places like DMB, but some of it's been customer input, some of it's been rep input. So it's how do we distinguish between those? When we do a clean, how do we do that clean? Do we look at the actual business entity itself? For example, we do a lot of work with them, but with the companies based on employee size. So if we do it just on employee size, we do that for the business or we do that for the group, you know, for the subsidiaries, parents, and all that. So it's trying to it's really trying to take a step back and understand what we're trying to do and trying to have as consistent as possible. But that isn't always the case. Yeah, I, um, I do totally agree that. You, you you might do some data project and then think, oh, we're, we're fine now, but yeah. actually it's something that's going to keep degrading and you have to keep doing stuff. You've got to keep doing it almost every day if you can, um, which we don't do. But one of the other things is to get rid of a lot of excess data. And we've got a lot of excess data there, which we're going through the process of trying to get rid of um, and just make sure that our processes are more streamlined so that the data we hold is less but a better quality. Mm -hmm. um, but it is. We've had some audits done on the data. It's good. You know, it's not perfect, it's not fantastic. Um, but the other thing around data is it's knowing when and how to use it. So the big thing is I'll do a report for somebody today. Somebody does a very similar report in a couple of days' time, gets different data results when you've taken a different time and some other people don't get that. So it's trying to educate people about, you know, just because I did a report a week ago it doesn't mean you'll get the same numbers next time because things do move yeah. in that period. So there's also an educational piece as well. Definitely, yeah. Um, Moving on to the sales reps now. So you mentioned that the sales team has doubled in the past two years. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for onboarding? I assume you probably had to have been involved in that process. Yeah, I mean, we've been onboarding a lot of people over the last couple of years. We've been lucky that now we're getting a lot of people in at the renewals, inside sales levels, that are then moving up to SDR level, then moving into the AE level where you don't need to necessarily do a lot of product training because they've been doing a very similar job and they understand mm -hmm. the company and everything else. But yeah, in the US, we've gone through some massive growth um, and we've had somebody out there who's really focused on sales enablement, making sure there's a good learning resource bank there. We use our pre-sales engineers an awful lot, mm -hmm. but we also use the other people in the business. So the AEs will take other new AEs or SDRs through that thing because they can relate especially closely to what is relevant in the real world. Yeah. And um, not just a technical sheet or a feature sheet, but actually what it does for the customer and mm. what it can solve for them. So we've got obviously a man that does some of the Salesforce specific training. I'll take some of the managers through other bits and pieces, but it's, it is really a collective effort. I mean, we've got a great people team there that set up the basics. I think a lot of the time it's getting that right. So when they turn up for work on the first day, they've got a laptop. Mm. You know, one of my jobs, I had to turn up and buy my own laptop and expense it. So you don't <laughs> want that sort of environment. You want it, everything to be smooth, yeah. everything to be there, um, and the managers sort of dipping in and out of the training and using people like us or people in marketing as and when they need to. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. So kind of empowering the other 
resources and companies yeah. to do that, and then you're just the puppet master at the back. A bit like that, yeah. We're just there behind the scenes, maybe coordinating a few bits and yeah. using sales enablement to then, you know, really sort of look at individual learning areas and to do all the testing and benchmarking there. Yeah, to make sure we're doing things properly. If you had to influence a salesperson to to start using a new process that maybe yeah. is not what they want to do, how have you? How would you go about that, or how have you have you done that previously? If it's sales, which is making mandatory, they can't do a thing <laughs> without doing it, but that sometimes can get people's backs up. Um, a lot of the time it's about communication with them. So it's about understanding what we're trying to solve by this new process or new feature that we're putting in. What is it we're trying to do? What are the problems with the way of doing it at the moment to make sure that's really clear to them? Um, so they can actually see, okay, this way of doing it isn't perfect. It might look perfect to me, but I can see how it's causing back-end problems in finance or we can't measure how many leads we're getting in marketing or something else is having a real big impact on the business. So they can understand the reason why we need to change, the impact that's going to have on them, as in if it's like a marketing issue, we can get better marketing data, better leads. Well, that's a bit of a win-win, and then we did put the process in. But it's also about making sure we try and communicate that with them, not just before we do it, but as we do it. Yeah. So we can get their feedback and we can say that this is what we're planning on doing. What are your thoughts? Can you see any? Because sometimes they can spot the issues that we won't, mm -hmm. any particular issues here. And they go, yeah, there's that you yeah, haven't considered. Okay, we can go back, we revisit, visit that, change the process slightly nice. and put it back in. And then it's really, we get them on board. We always try and make sure we have got sort of um, sales champions as well in different teams mm -hmm. so that they can be the immediate go-to person for the other team. Um, but then obviously we've got sales ops and maybe the IT core function to go in there and help out if needed. Got it. Um, and what are you doing at the moment to make reps more productive? Trying to basically take as much of the back end stuff away from them as possible and try and make it more around getting them time on the phone. So I've always been really keen to look at the sales reps or people in sales should be spending as much time as possible in front of customers or talking mm -hmm. to customers in some way or doing something with a customer and not worrying about back-end problems or what commission they're going to get paid this month or anything else. So it's trying to take that away from them. And it's very much like sport in that respect where, you know, yeah, you've got Ben Stokes who wins the Ashes for England and wins the World Cup for England. But actually, although he's a fantastic cricketer, there's a team behind him making sure he's eating the right things, making sure he's doing the right training, the right exercise, getting into the ground on time, making sure he's got enough bats in his bag, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is making sure that we're putting our sales teams in that position, but they don't have to think. They can just think, right, today, I've got these leads to follow up, these customers to call, and then it just goes really smoothly. The cricket analogy. I like it. Very timely. <laughs> <laughs> Did, um, do you think that the way to measure, accurately measure time spent selling? Because you're saying that's an important metric, right? Yeah. yeah can you actually measure how, many, how long salesperson is spelling selling and then track that over time to see if you guys are doing a good job um you can in some roles and we've, i've done that successfully in some roles but mm -hmm. i think in a lot of roles it's different especially when you're in more of a consultative sales process where you need to understand and spend time researching the customer mm -hmm. is how do you quantify that and that's really important you can't just pick up a phone and prospect somebody you need to understand their business what pains they might be having their, their immediate team so a lot of that's Stuff goes on in the background. They might need to go away and check some technical information about a tool that we might be recommending to them. So there's a lot of stuff that you can't actually measure. Um, what you can look for is general sales activity, and I can give you a steer as to whether we should be doing more or less. Mm -hmm. But just because somebody does a lot of activity doesn't mean they're the greatest salesperson. True. Um, and I've known salespeople who have had probably the weakest number of sales activities, but you give them five leads, they'll close four for you. And uh, it's a you know it's a good indicator, but it's not the bill and end all. Sure. Um, can we quickly jump to forecasting? We touched on that earlier with Inside Square. Yeah. What is your role in the forecasting process? Are you like actually creating the forecast and then giving them to the managers, or do you give the managers the tools to then go forecast? Um, we're a little bit behind the times on that. We're still using Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> which might surprise a lot of people and be a bit of a shock. On we are looking at ways we can get that a bit more automated and. Mm. Yeah, some of that sits with me, and uh, apologies to VP of Sales, but I forgot to do it yesterday because <laughs> I was off. Um, so it's not perfect, and that's why we're looking at other ways. Yeah. So basically, obviously, Salesforce is holding a lot of information there for the opportunities that we have. But for the quarter, for you know, a big chunk of our revenue, for you know, almost 10% of our revenue or, or more, um, it's a transactional sale with a 14-day sales cycle. 
So we can't look at what we're going to do for the next quarter. Yeah. We can only look at historic data and put that run rate into a forecast mm-hmm. machine. With the accounts team, again, it can be a bit lumpy now because we've got some big deals coming in. You know, some of our deals can be, you know, certainly six figures. So get a couple of those in and then it changes slightly. So it's understanding that. So each manager puts in their own team's number um, in terms of commits, likelies, um, best case scenarios, and that just gets totted up and used as a forecast moving forward. But it's, it's probably not starting because it should be. Uh, yeah. But it, yeah, we do this in a year's time, I'll have a different answer for you. So they, they submit to you and then you create the forecast. And then you go straight to the forecast spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. Each person goes in there. And, yeah, so it's really managed by the VP of sales. Got it. Okay, nice. And and then you, you've also given them the inside square tool to help them manage yeah. their reps. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Ops will set up various dashboards for them and reports to make sure they can accurately track the forecast. We can go back with, look, historically on web revenue, we do X amount per day. Mm-hmm. So we've got so many days left. This is what we think we're going to come in with. We do look at historic trends because, yes, there's, we're not a particularly seasonal business, but some quarters or the end of quarters better than another. Yeah. So even on web revenue, we won't just do ten thousand dollars a day. We might do six, seven, eight thousand at the start of the month and then ramp up at the end and do twelve, fifteen. Got it. So it's trying to look at those little quirks as well. Nice. Um, and then a question that we don't normally ask about the the different because you've spent time being a salesperson, yeah, sales manager and now sales operations. Do you think there is a different skill set <coughs> required for a sales manager versus a sales operations person? Or do you think that the same person could be equally effective at both roles? I think you can be equally effective at both. Um, again, to chuck a sport analogy, you can have football managers that are very um, charismatic and engaging and sort of take people with them on that journey um, without necessarily being the best tactical person. But then you have other people that are very much into the tactics, like the Arsene Wenger sort of managers who very much go on that rather than personality and they can still do the same thing. Um, I think having worked in sales has given me a massive help because it makes me understand what the challenges are personally for the managers, personally for the reps, but also for the wider business as a whole. And I think, it, you know, certain comp plans, the first thing you do as a sales rep is how can I make the most out of this? What loopholes are in there that yeah. I can look at? Yeah. And having done the job of looking for those loopholes myself and managing those, then you start to get to you know what's fair for the business and what's fair for the individual. So I think it definitely helps having that sales yeah. background. Um, and I don't see any reason why somebody can't move between one and the other. Okay. So are you saying that sales experience is necessary to succeed in sales ops? I wouldn't say it's necessary, but I'd say it's a big help. It's a big help. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Moving on to metrics. Yeah. So throughout your career in management and operations, what has been a metric that you found incredibly insightful or useful? So it depends on the role I've been doing at the time, what I've been trying to measure. You know, BT, for example, it was definitely activity-based. If we measured activity and activity was good, pretty much the numbers would stack up at the end. Um, so, for, for example, the number of phone calls in a day? Phone calls, customer visits, how many times you saw the decision-maker, that sort of thing. We're talking yeah. quite a low level there. Um, but on a, on a business such as Redgate, um, it would be things like um, average deal size and sales cycle, um, the amount of touches and engagement you have with a customer, um, the win rate as well, because you know you don't want to just burn through the leads that mm-hmm. you're getting, but then you don't want people just keeping, um, you know, having a really good win rate because they've kept everything in open still and they're yeah. still working it, even though it's two years old, yeah. um, and that person never has any loss. You know, you don't want to see that either. So, I, I guess it depends where you are on what you're trying to drive again, as well as the behaviour thing. You're trying to drive revenue, or you're trying to drive longevity with your customers by maybe tying them into a longer renewal cycle. Mm-hmm. So you sell them a three-year support deal rather than a one-year support deal. Is that important for you? And actually within the business, you'll have different people focus on different things as well. Yeah. So they might focus on you know, net yields and our dollar retention value is absolutely critical to them, but to somebody else, it's just the win rate and the average deal size. For somebody else, it, um, it might be more activity-based because it's more of a transactional sale. So Got it. it really does vary as to what you're trying to measure. Nice. Final question. Yeah. Who in sales operations has taught you the most? So I looked at that question. That was a really hard one to come up with because I've sort of drifted into sales ops. I didn't have anybody sort of guiding me down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, currently I've got two great, um, two great sales ops people, Amanda and Leslie. And shout out to Amanda. Big shout out to those two. 
Um, I hope they're watching at some point. Um, they've been really, you know, inspirational for me, you know, because I've got a great team behind me, so I can focus on things that are important to me and the other parts of the business. Um, but some of the sales managers I've had over the years, and it's not just about sales, it's about managing people. Because when you're in sales ops and the management level and the leadership level there, it's about engaging with other stakeholders. It's about getting other people on board who are probably maybe not onto your wavelength and maybe don't agree with what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. So you've actually got to do a selling job on them. And I've had some really fantastic managers over the years. Um, a guy called Steve at Arena Sun Control, for example. Um, at Sky, we had a great leadership team there. But I've also had some really bad managers over the years. And I've probably learned as much from those, I won't name them, mm-hmm. <laughs> as I have the good ones. Yeah. Because you see how they've, take, or they've not taken people along on that journey with them how they engage, what they do, and what they look at and what they don't look at. Mm. And you can see plans are obviously going to fail, but they're just going ahead with yeah. because they haven't looked at the wider picture or the details sometimes. And I've picked up lots, stolen lots of bits of information, stolen loads of tips, stolen loads mm. of resources over the years, and just taken that into what I do now. No. So there's no one person. It's mm. just a combination of things. But, yeah, I think... Managing up is a really important thing when you're in sales ops because you're often reporting to a very senior person in business. You're dealing with some very, very senior people across the business, mm-hmm. that exec team, and sometimes you need to be confident in what you're doing um, and actually push back a lot of the time as well. You do things because they're right, not because somebody's told you what they want yeah. to hear. Agreed. Now, let me share what I've particularly enjoyed here in this conversation. The idea that data quality is not like one-off thing. It's like a living thing within your CRM that you have to keep tending to. Um, and then I like the two sporting analogies. So, yeah. yeah, I really like how looking at a salesperson like Ben Stokes yeah. and you're everybody in the background, like giving them everything that they need to go and close the deals. Yeah. And then the difference between the Arthur Wenger type analytical leader and then a more like emotional, maybe Jose Mourinho, I don't know if he's yeah. or not. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what he does. Um, and, and, and the difference, the difference in skill set being yeah. managing in operations and actually how there you can be either but still be successful. I th- yeah, I think having a balance of the two, like in most things, is a good thing to have mm-hmm. because you want to, sometimes you need that enthusiasm to drag people along, but sometimes you've got to rely on that technical backup. And the, the technical backup is the evidence behind it. You, know, you can take people with you with an inspirational mm-hmm. message, but then you need to have some backup data as well to yeah. prove what you're saying is correct. So, so would you say you have? The, the two it's maybe a hard question to answer, but you have the two sides of like the manager, the inspirational, and then the analyst school. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and on that note, Simon, thank you so much for coming on. That's okay. Thanks a lot.